Derek Miller's 10 Rules of Writing, version one. Why version one? Because I reserve the right to grow and learn and change my mind, that's why. It is May 5th, 2020. I'm in the middle of writing a book because I do that. And I was inspired to look up Elmore Leonard's 10 Rules of Writing. Elmore Leonard was a very well-known, deeply beloved crime writer, um, and he wrote 10 Rules of Writing. I'm going to read them to you very quickly, without comment. Never open a book with weather, meaning never start off. It was a dark and stormy night. Number two, avoid prologues. Number three, never use a verb other than said to carry dialogue. Number four, never use an adverb to modify the verb said. Number five, keep your exclamation points under control. Number six, never use the word suddenly or all hell broke loose. Number seven, use regional dialect, patois, sparingly. Number eight, avoid detailed descriptions of characters. Number nine, don't go into great detail describing places and things. Number ten, Try to leave out the part that readers tend to skip. Now, whatever you think of them, they're fun. I'm going to tell you very, very briefly a couple of comments on these, but then I want to move forward and I want to tell you some of my own, which are really quite different and have come from a sort of a different way of conceptualizing writing. Also, keep in mind that I'm not really going for the same audience that Elmore Leonard might be going for meaning um, a huge one that's universally loved by many, many people and made him filthy rich. I'd like to, but I, I don't know how. Uh, never open a book with weather. I don't care. Avoid prologues. Yeah, it's lazy. If you don't know what your story is or where it begins, and if I read one more crime novel that begins in italics, that's two to three pages long with a prologue, followed by a first-person narrator, I, I, I'll lose it. But that's my own issue. Never use a verb other than said to carry dialogue. Eh. Never use an adverb to modify the verb said. Jokingly. Do what you need to do. Keep your exclamation points under control. Yes, he's right. Keep all your, keep, just be under control. Be in control. Exclamation points, perhaps, even more. Um, number six, never use the word suddenly or all hell broke loose. Don't use, don't use cliches. Try to avoid cliches unless using the cliche is part of the shtick that you're engaged in, right? Woody Allen did some dinner scene, I can't remember which movie it was, where everybody was only speaking in cliches. It was hilarious, but it was under control. Use regional dialect sparingly, fine. Um, avoid detailed descriptions of characters. I couldn't, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, it, your, your characters are going to need whatever space they need. Don't tell Michael Chabon not to describe his characters. It's, you won't be reading a Michael Chabon novel. Don't go into great detail describing places and things. Um, I think you need to do what you need to do. And number 10, leave out the parts that readers tend to skip. Yeah, yeah. But let's look at this slightly differently and have a little fun with it, okay? Here are mine. Number one, story comes first. What does that mean? The story coming first means that all the other things that might be inspiring you to write and all the other things that you love during the process of your writing are eventually going to have to be held up and considered against the story that you are telling. And you're going to have to ask yourself whether or not what you're writing, this description, this character, this line of dialogue, anything, is supporting and advancing the story. That doesn't mean that you have to be tied every single moment to the plot. But it does mean that you are ultimately telling a story. And if that sense that a story is happening is getting lost, then you're abandoning the your fundamental objective, which is 
to delight and enrich the soul of the person that you're communicating with. Number one, story comes first. Number two, sustain the fictional dream. To be swept away in a story, or swept up in a story, you don't have to be swept away, but you're swept up, you're carried into a new world. You've stepped through the looking glass, you have fallen through the rabbit hole, you have all the other metaphors about, <clears throat> about leaving your physical world behind and falling into the story itself. That's where you want to be. And that dream is sustained. It is sustained by the writer in negotiation with the reader. The two of you together are crafting something as the reader goes through every single word, every single sentence, every paragraph, and, and is creating that world along with you. That sense of being in a place and being indwelling in this universe, this Narnia, wherever it is, needs to be complete. You need to be completely immersed and you as the re excuse me writer need to sustain the fictional dream. So digressions, tangents, backstories, um, uh, uh, flashbacks, they're only good if it is what the reader needs next to stay in the story. Can you need to go backwards next? Yeah, that, that can happen, absolutely. Sometimes there's something, you reach a juncture where the hunger to understand is what's driving reader interest. And then providing some release for that by providing some knowledge, providing some backstory, is precisely what the fictional dream is, 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 is what's required to remain inside the story. That's number two. Number three, no interchangeable dialogue. There are some perfunctory utterances that people are going to spit out, right? Let's go. I'm hungry. Where's the bathroom? That's fine. I mean, you, people talk. Past the salt is, 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 is is perfectly legitimate to put into a novel. But your characters should have their own personalities, their own thoughts, their own ideas, their own preferences, their own tonality, um, their own voices, right? They're, they, they're, they, are, they are people. And if you think of any two people you know, they don't speak the same. They don't have the same, uh, some of it is, is, is their conversational style, right? So everything that gets mimicked by a comedian in like Saturday Night Live, Dana Carvey doing uh, George Bush, for example, right? The, the hand gestures, the voice, all that, that's not gonna be carried through well in a novel. It's hard to, to create that. So that really means that the dialogue is your primary vehicle for character explanation. Sorry, brief interruption there and I'm back. So because no people speak the same, you shouldn't be reading them and you shouldn't be confused as to who's speaking at any given time. There are moments when you have quick repartee between two characters and you really need to throw in a he said, she said, uh, 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 you know, indexes so that your, so your reader doesn't get confused because sometimes it's a little fast. And sometimes there's just a lot of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and you get lost a little bit as you're reading along. And so, so the, the cues need to be set up, and that's, that's fine. But the main thing is, is that the characters should be distinct. Now, this is where serious writers become very different from dime store fiction writers. 
Because the dime store fiction writers, they're so tied to the plot and that the story is everything that the characters barely exist. They don't really, they, they, are, they are puppets. They are plot puppets. And they have no distinct characters. They have names usually with a twitch. This guy has a scar. This one has a limp. This one's fat. This one, you know, whatever. But it's, it's, a, it's just enough, just enough to, give, to let the reader differentiate one character from another as they are moving around on the set piece um, of the stage. If that's the kind of writing you're doing, fine, but again, go find your teacher for that because I don't know the first thing about it and I, I'm not good at it. I think there should be no interchangeable dialogue uh, because there should be no interchangeable characters because people aren't interchangeable. Number four, respect your own rules. I don't care if you're writing a romance novel or a Western or fantasy or science fiction or contemporary fiction or literary fiction or it's a mishmash of these things or science fiction or it's a mishmash. None of the genres don't matter. Your, your world will have rules. You, it may come down to extravagant rules like how much gravity is on a planet that you've created, you know, 75% of Earth gravity. In which case, if somebody passes somebody the salt, right, I expect, and if one person's from Earth and the other is from, you know, whatever, Alpha Centauri Minor number six, he's going to pass the salt and it's going to go flying off the table because he used too much force because it only has 75% gravity there. That's your rule. You created the planet. You made that dish not salty enough. That's up to you. I didn't make you do it. Reader didn't make you do it. You did it. So if all those things are true, you have to obey that rule. This is also true when it, things get more sophisticated in a different kind of way, by which I mainly mean emotionally sophisticated. If this is the kind of character that is intellectually articulate but emotionally inarticulate, you can't have that person suddenly start waxing poetic at some certain moment where they suddenly find the inner resources to be able to explain their states of mind and their personal motivations and, and the primary movers and causes of their own anxieties or, or challenges or passions or loves or lusts. Where did that come from? You're violating your own rule. You're violating your own character. Don't do that. It yanks you out of the fictional dream. It confuses the story. It, um, it, it creates this, um, this, this disjuncture between everything you've read and what you're now encountering, making you now look in retrospect at what you've been reading and start to wonder, wait, was I missing something? Did I, did I read that incorrectly? So respect your own rules, emotional rules, physical rules, rules of physics, rules of love, and, and to some extent, set up your rules as well, but mainly respect your own rules. Number, number five, this is going to be pretty banal, but you heard it here first. Give every character a birthday. I know. What's more boring than giving every character a birthday? I'm not saying tell them what the birthday is. Don't like tell everybody what their birthday is, right? Nobody cares when your character's birthdays are unless they're having a birthday party. But you need it as your side notes about these people. <clears throat> because the answer to the question of what's more boring than giving your characters birthdays is this. After your manuscript has been accepted, after it has gone through editing, after you've designed the book cover, after we figure out how to position it in the marketplace, after the launch date's been set, after you have intellectually and creatively moved on, you're now on a new project and because the book that you're publishing is now in production, now comes back from the professional copy editor who has noticed that Mary isn't 35 years old. She thinks she might be 34 years old. And, she, and the copy editor asks you, how old is Mary? Now... You're going to stop 
what you're writing, you're going to have to reread your whole damn book to figure out how old Mary is, because that's really not the copy editor's job. Copy editor, God bless her, caught, caught the problematic and went back to see if there was an obvious solution to it. Failing to find that obvious solution, had to ask you, the author. If you know what month and year it is in your book, which you probably do, right? I mean, it's this stuff varies, but you, you probably do. And you know your character's birthday, you can do the arithmetic. Failing that, you're going to have to find out whether or not you mentioned that the character was seven years old in 1982 or not. And you, you have some vague memory of that, but the book's been through three different versions and chapters have been yanked in and out, and you don't, you don't remember. You don't remember. So you're going to have to read your book. This is very, very, very frustrating because it yanks you out of not your fictional dream, but your life itself, which is the only thing actually worse. It's, a, it's, 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 it's sort of publisher abduction, but the problem is you did it to yourself. Um, don't do that. Just give your character a birthday. If, if I say, you know, Sheldon was 82 years old, and then I need to just count backwards from the date that it is in 2008 and figure out what his birthday was. And then everything else falls gently into order and you can march right along. Don't tell the reader. Just note it down for yourself and move on. Number six. This one's slightly different from the others, but it's, it's critical. When I say the story comes first, when I say sustain the fictional dream, when I say respect your own rules and all that other stuff, one thing that's really at the core of this, and I find it to be the most useful question you can ask yourself at any given moment in time, and I think it's imperative that you ask yourself this question often while you're writing, the question is this. Why am I telling them this? Why am I telling them? There has to be some legitimate reason for why it is you are describing something, explaining something, having people argue, having that car chase, having that dragon appear out of nowhere. You may not know, while you're writing it, the answer to that question. You may just be riffing you may just be in the flow, right? As rappers say, right? Which I think, by the way, is true for every artist about anything they're doing ever. I just, that's the term of art. And I'm fine with it. And you may just find it groovy at that particular moment in time. There's nothing wrong. Go run with it. Run with it. Go, 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 go. But later on, you're going to reread that. And as you're reading it, you're still you. And you are still the writer. And you're going to have to ask yourself, why am I telling them this? Is it, and the criteria are, am I still in the dream? Am I still uh, engaged in this story? If you don't have an answer to that, it might not belong there. You might need to edit it out. You might need to take it out. Number seven, challenge your comfort zone. It's a funny experience, but... I find that things that I think are too much while I'm writing them under the broad categories of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? Whether it's murder or mayhem or whether it's a, a shootout or whether it's a, a, a love scene or whether it's, it's sex gone wrong or sex gone right. or It, it could be anything. It could be anything. I find that as I'm writing it, I'm thinking, "Wow, this is this is pretty this is pretty incendiary stuff." When I read it later, I tend not to think so. I tend to think, "Oh, that's you know that's big, that's bold, but it's it doesn't feel quite as uh, explosive as it did when I was creating it." And I think. And I have to admit, I'm speculating. When other people write when they're stoned, or write when they're drunk, or write or take drugs, none of which I do. And I'm not being moralistic about it, but I find that when my mind is ordered and under control, I am far more productive than when my mind is not under control. Plus, 
I, my mind is so all over the place all the time anyway that the idea of, of, of turbocharging it with, with stuff strikes me as, as insane. Um, but I think that when people are using substances, one of the things that they're doing is they're lowering their inhibition levels to be um, adventurous in their writing. I don't think it's making them more creative. I think it's just making them more flirtatious with possibility. And yeah, I mean, this is exactly like trying to get laid at a party. I'm, I'm not, I'm not unaware of what I'm saying here. Um, you, you, I does not. In fact, let's stick with the metaphor. You know, having four shots of whiskey is doesn't make you more attractive. It does, however, make you more likely to risk going over and saying, hi. So, you kind of need to do that with scenes. You need to have the guts to go bananas. Now, other people might say, no, you need to be stoned in order to come up with cone heads. And that might be true. I don't know. I don't know. But I find that I write some pretty bizarre stuff and I don't need to be stoned for it. So... Interesting question. Should I get stoned in order to see and have a comparison? The scientist in me says, yeah, that would make sense. But I think I'm going to skip it. In any event, challenge your comfort zone by pushing yourself out. Push yourself out on anything where it is... It has to be related to the story. I'm not saying just go bananas. That You're not in therapy. You're writing a book. But if you're writing about sex, have fun with it. Go do things that you might not want to, might not do yourself, but you, you've always wondered about, or more to the point, you think this character would do even if you wouldn't, because that's really what's key. Um, same thing with, I'm not saying with violence you need to be sadistic. I'm just saying it, if it makes you a little uncomfortable, it, that is not necessarily the criteria for whether or not it should be included. You need to be more faithful to something else other than your comfort zone. Ergo, challenge your comfort zone. Number eight. This is something else. This goes back a little bit to the flow thing. If your writing is going well, don't question it. That may sound as though it's contradictory to the other rules, which sound more structured. Story comes first and sustain the fiction dream and all that. But writing and editing while they are one and the same, while writing is editing, and I've heard all the platitudes, of course they're not the same. What creating something out of nothing is an adventurous, godly act. You know, that, that's it. The, it. I mean, something from nothing. Now, it's not technically nothing. There's other stuff going on in your head. Stuff is, is emerging out of other things, but let's not get technical at the moment. The creation of something is when there is some flow, there is some movement, there is some... The, the gestures, the ideas, the visualizations, they're coming to you. You're having fun. You're in this dialogue. These characters are arguing. It's going well. Don't question it. Don't stop. Don't accept interruptions. A thousand words might pour out of you in half an hour. That's a day's work in half an hour, right? 3,000 words could come pouring out. You could be in the middle of watching television, and suddenly you have an idea, you go sit down, and suddenly this all this stuff comes gushing. Don't question it. Doesn't mean use it. You might, you might not, don't know. Don't stop yourself. Don't inhibit yourself. Don't slow down when you feel it. And I'll tell you something as somebody who has now written about seven or eight manuscripts, all right? I'm talking a million words or more. If you're having fun, it is a very strong indication that somebody else might be having fun too. It isn't proof positive. You don't know this. But if you're wrapped up in what you're doing, it's, there's a, you're on to something. And it's most often the stuff that I write that pours out of me 
and I get emotional with, and I start to cry while I'm doing it, or I'm laughing, and I, I do this. I sit in a room. These are the emotions I have by myself in a tiny little room, which I, I'm actually going to find out whether or not the, the, the cells in Guantanamo are larger than this or not. I, I am curious, or Alcatraz or something. Um, if you're having fun, it's very possible that you're creating the fun that others are going to have. And I think that you should always err on that presumption. So if the writing is going well, don't question it. That's number eight. Number nine, abandon your outline. To hell with James Patterson and his frickin' outlines, okay? Your outline is your first draft of your novel, even if it's on a napkin. The notion that you're going to stick to that by the end, is ridiculous. Only the thinnest, most fragile minds writing for the same can come up with an outline that's going to be good enough for an audience later on, right? Unless it's beginning, middle, end, right? You know, it, there's, there's nothing... You're not listening to your own writing. You're not listening to the characters. You're not growing. They're not growing. Nobody's changing. Nobody's evolving. Nobody's reacting to circumstances. If, if you are not changing what's happening to them subsequent to what you've already written. They're not. They're not. They're going to be flat. They're going to be flat characters. It's going to be a flat plot. And yes, it's going to have twists in it. But you're going to forget it years later. You know, if you've written 70 novels, you can't have distinct characters in 70 novels. They're going to be the same meat puppets, you know, plot puppets, wandering around inside these, these devices with timed twists along the way. And, you know, if you can make a living doing that, then fantastic. And I'm not berating you. I'm not. I swear to God, being rich is better than being poor. If you could figure out how to do that by doing nothing but putting words on paper, then God bless you. And I sincerely mean that. And none of us are going to be remembered in the end anyway. So just, 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 just bring, create joy where you can and whatever. But the thing about the outlining is that it's a novel. It's a story, and what you thought was going to be the case is very unlikely to be the case if you're writing anything interesting along the way. Abandon your outline. That, by the way, means that you probably need to have an outline to abandon. So I'm not throwing James Patterson out with the bathwater, but don't just stick to it. It's not a screenplay. It isn't a screenplay. A screenplay has to direct, is the anchor for a budget of $40 million. You don't abandon that because they got to build the sets, they got to do the costumes, they got to do the hair, they got to do the location scouting. People get hired, they got to go on set, they got to get off set, they got other things to do with their time. Boom, 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 boom. This is, but you're writing a novel, it's not a screenplay, right? So, and your screenplay is a whole, that's a whole different, that's, that's a different, that's a different lecture series. I'll talk about screenwriting another time. Abandon your outline. Number 10, final one. Have fun. Have fun for you. Have fun for the benefit of the people around you. Have, ben have fun for the readers in your future. Have fun for the people that you go to dinner with who are saying, how's it going? And you can say, I'm having a great time. Have fun for your soul. Have fun for the souls of others. This is what you have chosen to do. There is no grail out there. The best writers are the people who are writing because the act of writing is where the joy is. We want reputation, we want awards, we want money. But this is just not the fast track to doing it. It takes a million words or 10 years to even figure out what it is you're doing and to become to write something that's probably worthy of really getting into the world. 
you might get faster than that. You might do your MBA, you might do uh, MFA, you might have a natural gift, whatever. But but generally speaking, it's going to be a lot of a lot of work. But the work should be the joy. And I think this is true for any artists. You know, I'm a lousy guitar player, but I enjoy playing the guitar. The act of playing. I like the feeling of it against my chest. I like the big sound that you get from a G chord. I like knowing that when I moved to the, the, you know, from an A to a C minor, that C minor bar chord really just felt perfect in my hands before I went to the D. I like the act of doing it. The act of playing the guitar is what brings me joy. I've played for nobody except my children in the bathtub, there in the bathtub. That's my audience. But the act of doing it is why I have three guitars, because they make me happy. The act of writing needs to make you happy, and I swear to God it's contagious. Um, what's his name? Stephen King says it's telepathy. Okay. Okay, well, of course he's going to call it telepathy, right? Stephen King. But, you know, okay, as a shorthand anyway, I'm absolutely fine with that. Your fun will come through. Your joy will come through. It's like a singer or a musician or a dancer, right? Um, a good actor. What's coming out of them is pouring into you. And you feel that. Rule 10, have fun. Quick wrap up. Because you always have to tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them and then tell them what you told them. Story comes first. Number two, sustain the fictional dream. Number three, no interchangeable dialogue. Number four, respect your own rules. Number five, give every character a birthday. Number six, have an answer to why am I telling them this. Number seven, challenge your comfort zone. Number eight, if the writing is going well, don't question it. Number nine, abandon your outline. Number ten, have fun. I hope this was interesting. I hope this was educational. I hope it was inspiring. And that's it. That's all I got. Have a nice day and good luck. Good luck with the next phase. Signing off.